Oh, come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise. And give him praise. Come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart. Your voice is raised. Your voice is raised. Give glory. Your voice is raised in glory. Father God, we come into your presence on this Pentecost Sunday when we remember that it was the promise of Jesus that he would send a helper. And Pentecost commemorates that. That your spirit descended upon men and indwelt them to change our lives, to give us power of the resurrected Christ within us. So we come on this Pentecost Sunday to worship you, to celebrate, Father, that your love and mercy have changed our lives and we come into your presence to worship you and say that we love you with all that we have and all that we are. So, Lord, we enter into your presence today. Ask you to fill this room with your spirit, to fill our lives wherever we are, where we're worshiping you with your presence. Touch us, Lord. Open our hearts to you, that we may know that you still reign and rule in our lives. Thank you, Father, for meeting us here today. Thank you for all that you do for us. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Father of light, you delight in your children. Father of light, in light, your children. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. Father of 
Father of lies, you never change. Never change. You have no turning. Father of lies, you never change. Never change. You have no turning. Every good perfect gift comes from you. comes from you. Every good perfect gift comes from you. Father of light, Father of light, Father of I 
than Jesus. Oh, Jesus, holy and anointed one, Jesus. Jesus, we love you. We love you beyond measure. We come to worship you today because you are the holy and anointed one of God, the Son of the living God. And so as we enter into your presence, as we worship you, may you inhabit the praises of your people. As we are saying, we love you, Lord. We love you with all of our life, with all of our heart, with all of our possessions with all that we are and all that we have. We love you. Thank you for meeting us here today. Thank you for speaking into our lives. Thank you that our salvation truly belongs to you, that in eternity past, you had a plan because you loved us. You wanted to redeem us. And you made us alive again in Christ Jesus because of that plan. So, Father, we thank you for being our salvation, for being the Redeemer who changes our lives, and we worship you. We worship you right now. Salvation belongs to our God sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb a praise and glory wisdom and thanks a honor and power and praise oh be to our God forever and ever be to our God forever shall be strong in purpose and unity, declaring aloud a praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength. Oh, be to our God forever. belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb a praise and glory wisdom and thanks honor and power and praise oh be to our God forever and ever be to our God 
forever and ever be to our God. 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 Forever and ever. Amen. Father God, we worship you. For you are our God forever and ever. Amen and amen. Well, it's Pentecost Sunday. It's good to be here with everyone. Just so you know, the we are in phase two in Kittitas County, which, which kind of means that we still need to be wearing our masks. But masks do kind of muffle what I'm trying to say to you. So I do have my mask for interpersonal things going on here in the church. Uh, the health department has asked us to do that. Did I lose signal again? Oh, boy. Pentecost Sunday, the Holy Spirit is supposed to be filling the place, and we have technological difficulties. Surprise, surprise. Here we go. <laughs> As I was saying, uh, we're in phase two of... Um, the reopening process, which means we can have 50 people in the building here in the worship center and overflow in other rooms to 25% of capacity of the room. And so we're working toward that. Next week is our relaunch opening, and the health department is requiring masks. Uh, one of the reasons is when you're in a congregation and you're singing, singing, we have discovered that is the number one way that we transmit the virus to one another is through projected vocalization, which is what singing is. So we appreciate it if you wear your masks. If you have medical conditions that prevent you wearing a mask, please let us know. Uh, there's a lot of grace for that. And uh, if you really have a medical condition that you are fearful, we're not stopping live streaming. I got a couple emails yesterday saying, are you going to stop live streaming now that you're reopening? Nope, we're not. Despite all the technical fun we're having and learning, we are going to continue this, and we are going to master this by the grace of God. So glad to have you all here. We do thank you for your tithes and offerings and gifts that continue to help keep the doors of the church open. We are doing some lots of ministry. You know, we're still working with Cole. They're doing over 200 lunches for the weekend nutrition packs for families in need, and that's been wonderful. We have lots of volunteers working at Hope Source and the food bank and helping out there. And it's, it's just good to see the hands and feet of Jesus working in our community. So we appreciate all that. We come to our time of prayer. And... Um, it's always our greatest privilege to take your requests and go to the throne of grace. So let's do that. Father God, we uh, enter into your presence this morning. We thank you for your great love for us and your watch care. We thank you that you are a God who loves us with an everlasting love. So Lord, as we enter into your presence, we come with grateful hearts. We come celebrating not only our salvation, but on this day of Pentecost, the helper that lives within us, who's always with us. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you loved us so much that you'd redeem us. And, Father, we come thanking you for answered prayer. There are so many things that are happening in people's lives, and you've been moving. And we give you thanks. We rejoice in how Monica Terrell is improving, and, and her recovery is progressing but we pray for the steady improvement, Lord. We ask you to continue to be with her. We pray for um, Harriet Craven's family, Lord. Harriet loved you with all her heart, and she went home to be with you, passed into your glorious presence the other day. So we ask you to comfort her family, you the God of all comfort. We continue to pray for uh, Cindy Altercan's niece, and we lift her up to you. He's his husband, actually, Tim, and we pray for you. He had a terrible accident, and he's in the ICU, Lord, and we lift him up, and we ask that you be with him, that your healing hand would be upon him. We ask that his, your presence would be known. We pray for the family of the man who's here on a site simic trip who died from a fall on top of Mount Pio on Wednesday, and we lift them up to you, that you would comfort them. We pray for those who uh, search and rescue are working towards finding, and we ask you to be with them and give them uh, the energy and strength and the infinite insight that you have so they can discover 
where the lost person is. And so, Lord, we lift them up to you. We continue to pray for um, Brittany's mom, and there's, you know, two strokes and a seizure, and doctors are still trying to resolve things, and we just ask that you would be with them, that you would be with Charlene and watch over her and care for her. We pray for the fact that you are going to work in their life, that infections and disease and all these other things that continue to strike at these people would be put at bay by your powerful presence and your healing hand. And Father, we think of um, the student who just um, a couple weeks ago learned she has cancer. We rejoice that it's treatable, but she will be staying with friends for a long time in Seattle, especially with the quarantine. And we ask, Lord, that you'd be with her, watch over her family, protect them all, and may your healing presence be known. And so, Father God, we just thank you for how you continue to move in our lives, how you continue to hear our prayers. And so we worship you. And Father, as we get ready to hear your word proclaimed and your word read, we just ask that you would burn into our hearts the truth that you would have us learn today, that we may grow in grace and truth for your glory. Mold and shape us, Father, since you are the potter and we are nothing more than the clay. And so, Lord, I ask that the meditations of my heart and the thoughts of my highly distractible, rambling, often confused mind will find acceptability in your sight. For you are our rock, our strength, and our gloriously precious Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from Mark 9, verses 2 to 13. Grab your Bibles, your electronic devices, turn with me to Mark 9, 2 through 13. And while you're doing that, I'll try to untie my tongue. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him and James and John and led them up the holy mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intense white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there he appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them and said, a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, Jesus, but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, Why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And now it is written of the Son of Man, that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it pleased, and that is, as it is written of them, the word of the Lord. It was a whirlwind six days. Peter's confession of Jesus, that he was the Son of God, the Anointed One, or as one translation put it, the son of the living God. It set off a chain of events where Jesus started teaching about his suffering and dying, and the hearts and minds of people were stirred. What does this look like? What does he mean? And Jesus said, you know, if you want to be my follower, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross and the burden of that cross and the pain of that cross, and you need to follow me all in, 100% committed. You can't hold anything back. It had been emotionally draining the people were surrounding Jesus. The disciples were processing everything. This teaching was challenging everything they believed about Messiahship. And there, as the sun was getting low in the sky, as the disciples were settling in and building a campfire and getting ready for the evening, Jesus looks over to Peter, James, and John and says, come with me. 
The other disciples didn't even really care. Jesus had been doing this for a while. Peter, James, and John were leaders, and Jesus often took them aside and talked to them individually and together. But they did notice that Jesus and the three were starting up the mountain. Meanwhile, they kept hanging out around the campfire and preparing for a night's sleep. As they ascended the mountain, the sun kept setting. And by the time they reached the summit of the mountain, the day was pretty much over, and a new day was beginning. And darkness engulfed the top of the mountain. And there, as the disciples' eyes were adjusting to the darkness, and they were catching their breath from ascending to the mountaintop, all of a sudden, Jesus is radiant white. The whiteness of his garments and his presence was so bright, it was better than any bleach job that any human being could ever do on a piece of white fabric. It was radiant and glowing and shining. And they were just amazed. Because all of a sudden, standing there with Jesus, they recognized Moses and Elijah. And Moses and Elijah and Jesus are having a conversation. John would later write about this moment in a very powerful way. He, he would say that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Can you imagine that? That God is light, and in him there is no darkness. Jesus would let her say, had already said something, and John recorded it for later when he wrote his gospel. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever walks, believes in me, and walks with me, what? Will never walk in darkness, because you will have the light of life living within you. John remembered that from this moment, seeing the radiance of Jesus on that mountain. This, this moment of radiance changed John's perspective on how you and I live in the light as a follower of Jesus Christ, because later he would say this, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from sin. If, if we're really walking in the light of God, we have fellowship with one another. That is, we as brothers and sisters in Christ who are following Jesus, we have fellowship, we have relationships. Jesus had said to them in the upper room, about to come, he will remind them of this moment, and he will say to them, you know, you, the world will know that you are my disciples when you love one another. It's a powerful moment that John will remember later. So why was Moses there? That was kind of interesting. Well, Moses was the lawgiver. He was the one who was the one who went up in the mountain and gave, got the Ten Commandments from God and brought it down. Uh, he was the prophet par excellence, but he was also the lawgiver. Elijah is there. He's representing the prophets. Um, Jesus is standing there as the Son of God, Savior, Redeemer. And so... There, the three of them are having Salvation History's preeminent summit conference. Because in the three of them, all of Salvation History comes together. And so there they are, and the disciples are just excited as could be, and just terrified at the same time. And all of a sudden, we have to think about Moses. Why would really Moses be there? And why does God do some of these things on mountaintops? How many of you have ever experienced a mountaintop experience with God? It's just outstanding. It's just wonderful. Moses, in Exodus 3, had his first mountaintop experience when on Mount Horeb, what is known as the mountain of God by the, the people, there was this bush that was burning, and Moses went and had a conversation. He had a conversation with a bush that was burning and was not being consumed. And it was there on that mountain, the place of the burning bush, where all of a sudden, what happened? God called Moses into a new direction. He called him to a new place of service. And he called the ground holy. The image of the burning bush, I'm sure, that fire that could not consume the bush became a visible image in Moses' life of his role as prophet and deliverer, and was always there for him to see and remember. Later in Exodus 24, we see that Moses took 70 elders, and they went up Mount Sinai, 
and a cloud descended, and the, God showed up, and he preached the sermon, and they saw the glory of the Lord. Moses continued up the mountain. Jo Joshua went with him for a little ways. And there on that mountain, Moses received the commandments of the law. And down in the valley, the people saw the fire on the mountain. They saw the glory of God as a devouring fire. A little bit later, another mountaintop experience, the people of God have rebelled. And so Moses ascends a mountain again in Exodus 33 and 34 and has a conversation with God, intercedes and pleads on God's behalf. He's asking God to forgive them. God finally asks Moses, can I, see, can I give you one request? You, and Moses says, will you show me your glory? Will you show me your glory? God said, well, you know, I can do that, but you know, no one can see my face. So he took Moses and put him in the cleft of the rock, put his hand over his eyes, and as he passed by, when he got by Moses, he took his hand off, and Moses saw the back of God's glory. God said, this is what he was, and he wanted to proclaim that he, God, I will make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. God is telling them that he's going to make sure that they know he is the Lord. He will reveal himself so that we know he is the Lord. So Moses represents the prophet who is going to bring about deliverance. And, and the Bible tells us Moses himself telling the new generation who's getting ready to go in the promised land, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, and it's him you shall listen to. This new prophet is one you should listen to. Moses represents the law and the tradition of deliverance that salvation history promises a deliverer. Now, Elijah, he's interesting because he's a very powerful prophet in the Old Testament, but he's not an author of any books. But someone recorded some stuff about him, so we know about him. He represents the, what all the Old Testament prophets did. That is, they called God's people back to God. They, they called them to prepare the way of the Lord, warning them to repent and return to God. And when they did repent, he, they promised that God's grace would be upon them. And that's exactly what God did. Prophets were the voices of the wilderness that called people back to a relationship with God. Now, we see this play out in some in Elijah's life because, you see, King Ahab was on the throne of Israel at the time. And the Bible declares that King Ahab did evil in the sight of the Lord. Matter of fact, the Bible gives an editorial comment there that Ahab was so sinful, he was more sinful than all the kings before him combined in their behavior and their activities, that he was the worst. And so God strikes the land with famine in the middle of the famine. God does this miraculous thing to a widow. She trusts Elijah, that she, so she took the last of her oil and flour and made him food. And what she discovered, that is in the midst of a famine, God still provides food because until the famine ended, she had an endless supply of oil and flour so she could feed her family. God moves in miraculous ways. But really, the story is moving because all of a sudden, Elijah and King Ahab have this confrontation. He says, you know, why don't you just assemble on Mount Carmel the 450 Baal prophets and 400 Asherite prophets, and let's have a mano a mano cage match. 850 to 1. Catch that, 850 to 1. And the people had to come. I mean, if they had television back then, the television ratings would have been out of this world. Everybody had to see this. And there, in the midst of all that, as the people are gathering, just before the show starts, Elijah says to them, as he comes near the people, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But of Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him. They did, they did not have a word for him. But isn't that what prophets do? Isn't that what Jesus is doing here for his disciples? He's been challenging them to follow him totally. If Jesus is Lord, then follow him. But if some other God is God, then follow him. Don't be wishy-washy. Don't be limp about it. Don't be half-hearted. 
be all in. But if God is God, then follow him. Here, the, what was going to happen on Mount Carmel was that they were going to build these altars and they'd pray for their God to bring fire down to consume the altar and, and consume the offering. And all of a sudden, the Baal prophets build all theirs and they start praying to their God and nothing happens and they keep praying to their God. And then they start cutting themselves and bleeding and, and they're doing all these gyrations and rituals and dance and nothing's happening. And, and Elijah's just egging them on because that's the type of guy he is. He just says, hey, maybe God's uh, asleep. Or maybe he, <clears throat> he's out in the outhouse. He can't quite hear you yet. And the conversation goes on. And finally, after nothing's happened, it's Elijah's turn. So Elijah prepares his altar. He cuts the meat and pours the blood on it the way the Old Testament prescribed. And then he said, does something really strange. He says to the servants around him, you know, let's uh, get some water, and I want you to dump it over my offering. And they dump three times seven quarts of water, and the runoff water filled the trench around the altar that Elijah had built. And Elijah started to pray. And immediately a fire came down from heaven, consumed everything on the altar, including the altar, and all every drop of water that was in the runoff trench was completely evaporated instantaneously. And the people all of a sudden, seeing the miraculous hand of God, fall on their face and say, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. What that reminds me is that when God moves in a miraculous way, there is only one response, to worship him. When God moves in a miracle, when God reveals his glory in some miraculous way, the only response is to worship him. Now, Elijah has a problem because Jezebel, Ahab's wife, has a mean streak that is 20 miles long. And she's upset that all these prophets that she helped support and care for and believed in have been slaughtered by Elijah. So Elijah flees for his life. And he winds up in a cave on the mountain of God, Mount Horeb. And there God and he have a conversation and an encounter with God. Our God says, I will show you who I am. And an earthquake happens and a wind happens and a fire comes. And all of a sudden, in a low whisper, Elijah hears the voice of God. God speaks to Elijah. God still speaks to us. The prophet Malachi said about Elijah this, that God will send, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So before Messiah could come, Elijah needed to come. Elijah was on the mountain representing the prophets and the deliverance of God and how God moves miraculously. But he was the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. God often speaks to us in miraculous mountaintop experiences. Mountaintops are great places to meet God, great places to spend time with God. But there was something else that took place in that mountain. There was a cloud. Clouds have repeatedly come out through the biblical history. It was a cloud that guided the people out of the bondage of their slavery in Egypt to the promised land. Not just as they left Egypt and crossed the Red Sea, but throughout their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, by day it was a cloud, and by night a pillar of fire. It was Moses going up a mountain that a cloud descended upon the mountain and the voice of the Lord spoke. It was a cloud that would come down to meet Moses at the place of worship, the tabernacle as it was called, and he would speak with Moses and give Moses the wisdom and words and guidance of how to instruct the people and how to settle disputes among the people. The cloud represented the presence of Lord. It was there on the mountain in Exodus 24 that the Lord descended in a cloud and preached the sermon that all the leaders of Israel could hear. Exodus 34 God and Moses are having a conversation, and 
Moses sees his glory, and Moses' response, the Bible says, was to bow and to worship him. By the way, in 1 Kings 8, we come to this verse 10, and it talks about how the Ark of the Covenant was now ready to be brought into the temple that Solomon had built. And the temple for all its glory was there, and the inner holy of holies was, was ready for the Ark. And the priests carry in the Ark, and all of a sudden the cloud descended on that room and in that room, and the priests had to flee out of the room because the glory of the Lord filled that room. They couldn't even be in that room with the presence of God. That's how big his glory was. The cloud reminds us that there's a visible sign that God's presence dwells among his people, that God loves to live in community. And on this Pentecost Sunday, it's something meaning, more meaningful for us because God promised that if we believe in Jesus, who do we have? We have a God living within us, the presence of God indwelling us. That's what Pentecost is about. The new visible sign for the New Testament follower of Jesus Christ is this, that God's presence is in you. You don't need a cloud anymore because he's inside of you and he moves in you and he talks to you and you can feel his presence and you know he's there. It's an exciting thing. There on mountains, God speaks. Elijah Moses in the cloud proclaim the truth that the plans and promises of the God across the centuries of the Old Testament, you hear that, across the centuries of the Old Testament, are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's what the disciples are witnessing there on that mountain. And then on the mountain, as Moses and Elijah fade into the background, the cloud descends and a voice booms out of the cloud, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Now think about that for a second. Peter and the disciples have been questioning all this thing about Messiahship. Oh, the Messiah really doesn't have to die and suffer and be raised again on the third day. They kept questioning it. They didn't understand it. And all of a sudden, here's God saying, listen to him. Listen to him. By the way, I just want to remind you that God has a message for you today, and here's what he's saying. Listen to Jesus. You think you have a problem in your life. You think you have a situation that is unbearable or unexplainably unsolvable, and you don't know what you're going to do. And I just want to tell you, God is saying to you, listen to Jesus, because Jesus has the final solution to any temporal problem you have, because all of heaven operates on Jesus' command and Jesus' word. Listen to Jesus. By the way, the disciples had heard that voice before. It wasn't their first encounter with that voice. They had heard it at the baptism. And they're terrified. I want to stop here for a second and just ask this question. What is the purpose of God revealing his glory to his people? He wants to give us a visible reminder that he lives with his people. The light, the glory of the Lord will always outshine the darkness of this world order. That gives me hope. That gives me hope. See, Mark is contrasting that very thing. Jesus has been teaching on the suffering that he was going to have to do and the fact that he was going to have to die. And when compared to the light of God's glory, it is a reminder that despite Jesus' suffering and all the pain he's going to endure, it does not compare to the glory of heaven and the being in the presence of living God. It reminds us that this pain in this life, the difficulties we face, the hardships that we go through, the circumstances that overwhelm us, does not compare to the glory of God and his indwelling in us and his presence with us. That God's will and God's glory always outshines everything else. And that is why Paul, in prison, remember that he's writing this from prison, says, oops, this is, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. He continues to say, We do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction, wait, wait St. Paul, light momentary affliction, weren't you shipwrecked? beaten numerous times, 39 times with rods, 
You were stoned to what they thought was the point of death. You've been abandoned by friends. That's light momentary affliction? When compared to God's glory, Paul says yes. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. See, I understand this. I'll never forget that afternoon in the fall of 1991. I was, I was in what they call back east in the Appalachian Mountains, a mountaintop plateau, which is basically nothing more than a small hill out here in Washington State with the Cascades surrounding us. You know, it's, a, it's, just, it's just nothing. But there I was in a cornfield on top of this plateau looking over the Taconic Valley when all of a sudden God moved and showed me the creation in such a new way that was breathtaking and captivating. And he started speaking to me, and there, I'll never forget, I fell face down in the ground, tears flowing, and he gave me some words of assurance in the midst of my grief and anguish of what was happening in my life that were comforting and calming. And in that moment, my life was changed. Mountaintops can do that. Matter of fact, Peter, thinking about this mountaintop experience, later writes this. He says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received glory, honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on that holy mountain. We were there. And what Peter is saying is the reason why I can say all these things to you is I was an eyewitness. I was an eyewitness of God's glory. I was an eyewitness of his redemptive work. I was an eyewitness of the resurrection that changes lives. I was an eyewitness. I heard God's voice. I can testify. He goes on to say there was a purpose for that. Because what I'm telling you now is a more prophetic word, the more fully confirmed, because I'm an eyewitness of that. And you will do well to pay attention to it. It is as a light shining in the, a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. He goes on to say, know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no one prophesies was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as the Holy Spirit carried them along. Scripture from eyewitnesses tell the story. God revealed himself in a majestic way. And the scripture that we have, the word of God that we have, was written by the Holy Spirit through other men. Using their literary style, using their abilities with language, because some of it's elegant Greek and Hebrew, and some of it's just plain street stuff. But that's okay. They were moved by God to proclaim the word of the Lord, and they did. You see, when God moves in mercy among his people, either by a miracle or revealing his majestic glory in a supernatural way, he is making us eyewitnesses to his glory. He's giving us a true testimony that can impact lives and change people's lives. When God moves, he's giving us a tangible reminder, often a visible one, that his presence still lives among his people, that he is still there for them. When he, God moves in miraculous ways, he's actually encouraging us. He's reminding us that the light of God can get us through the dark times of this world order. And that light of life will change our life. God uses mountaintop experiences to reveal himself to strengthen our faith. And mountaintops are great, but boy, can we mess them up. Amen? Peter is there. The glory of God's presence is everywhere. And all of a sudden he says, hey, uh, Jesus, it's a good thing I'm here because I got this plan. 
Let's build a tent for Moses and a tent for Elijah and a tent for you. Let, let's just build this up. It'd be a place of honor. It'd be great, man. Peter just inserted his foot right again into his mouth. By the way, there are a lot of academic speculations on why Peter said what he said, and we could spend some time going down through the list of them, but you know, I, I find them fruitile and useless because Mark here gives us a clarification. He says, Peter did not know what to say. Peter wasn't one of those guys who, when he didn't know what to say, kept his mouth shut. Basically, Peter doesn't know what to say, so he starts rambling out some ideas. He's engaging the mouth before he engages the brain. And I, and I resemble that. I'm never going to throw stones at Peter because I often do that. You know, you start, you're not sure what to say, so you start saying things, and you just keep rambling and bob, babbling and, and all sorts of minutiae coming out. And you're just hoping that somewhere in the midst of all that, somebody will find something profound in it, and it will stick to the wall or stick to their life, and it's great. And Peter was there. Didn't know what to say. So he rambled useless phrases. And that reminds me that oftentimes when we have a mountaintop experience, we can mess up God's plan. God is doing something on the mountaintop that will help our lives, and yet we still like to mess up his plan. And in light of the context of where we are here in Mark and what Jesus has been teaching, one of the things that happens is we like to make Jesus part of our life, but only a part of our life. See, we like hanging out with Jesus because he's cool, does wonderful things. We like his input on things. We like to talk to him. But give up control of our life? Eh, I don't think so. Because in our human nature, we want to stay in charge. We want to be in control. We work at living good lives. We help people out in the community. We speak kindly to others. We try to be respectful and nice to strangers. We do good things because we want God to bless us. And so we give some money to good causes as we see fit and can afford it, and our desires are already taken care of. And we give leftovers. But remember this. Jesus did good things. Jesus did a lot of good things. He did a lot of miraculous things. And yet, the Son of Man still had to suffer and die. The one who did no wrong thing would have to suffer and die. You see, the truth of the matter is, Jesus doesn't want to be a part of your life. He wants to be involved in every detail in every moment of your life. He wants all of you or none of you. He wants 100% commitment. He wants 100% commitment. And here's the other thing that we do that messes up God's plans. We try to do something big for God. Hey, that's when the ego trip and the pride sometimes get in. He says, if I'm truly going to be a follower of Jesus, I need to do certain things. So we start going about doing our good deed list. Uh, we want God to kind of notice that we're doing good things. We want him to keep a tally, so he's writing them down, you know, or a DVD tape, whatever it is. And then we start thinking, well, you know, I have to get noticed by God, so I'm going to do something big for God. So like Peter, we're trying to build these monuments to God's glory. And our minds race through dozens of ideas. We start building our agenda and our plans. Often we build our religious habits in an attempt to impress God about how good we can worship Him instead of just freely worshiping Him, the one who loves us. Instead of spending time with Him and building the relationship with Him, we spend all of our energies doing things. And men, I'm going to pick on you right now, so because I'm going to think God's called you to be leaders in your home, so I'm, I'm going to throw you under the bus and back up a few times. That type of commitment is like the husband who says, I love my wife, 
and spends all his time doing things in the name of providing for her and the family, but rarely ever gets to spend time with her. All the smoozing and wooing that he did during the dating period is long gone. He's got her. He doesn't have to do that anymore. So he's off doing his thing. And all of a sudden, she feels lonely, realizes that something's missing in her life. The relationship, the friendship of a spouse, her husband, whom she gave her heart to, is dying and withering because he's not there. And he will say, I'm doing things for the relationship. But he's not an active participant in the relationship. And that's what God is saying to us, that sometimes we do all this stuff for God, but we really mess up God's plan when we keep doing things and fail to be a participant in the relationship with God. God is calling us to a relationship. God is calling us to spend time with his son Jesus and to listen to him. I came up with some lessons from the mountaintop experience that will help us. The first thing I think we need to be reminded of is don't call Jesus the Lord of your life until you truly understand lordship. Don't call him Lord of your life unless you understand lordship. See, lordship simply means that every detail of your life, he will give you guidance, he'll speak into, he'll give you direction. Take, for instance, maybe there's someone out there who's a single person. You're looking for love, and so you're on the dating websites. You know, you got your Tinder, and you got your eHarmony, and you got your Match, and you got all of them, you know? And you got your profile built, and you're reading other people's profiles, and, and you're looking. You're on Christian Mingle and other sites. But I just want to ask you something. Have you truly placed it in Jesus' hands? As a single father of three, I was busier than you can believe. I was pastoring a church, but there was still a spot in my life that was kind of empty and didn't know how I was going to fill it. But, you know, I gave it up, and I started focusing on church. I started focusing on raising my kids as a single dad the best I could. And then God, by the way, who is the greatest matchmaker history has ever known and seen because he was actually the first matchmaker there in the garden, you know, Adam and Eve? Yeah. The great matchmaker, after I had surrendered it to him, at a singles thing that our church was going to sponsor, that nobody showed up to but two people. The the person who was helping me build the group and co-host it, and a lady by the name of Sue White, who became Sue Wilson. God, the great matchmaker, found the perfect partner for a crazy, wonderful, blended family situation that would evolve from this, who was crazy in love enough with me and with her God that she would leave family, no offense, guys in Vermont, leave family behind and follow wherever God called us to go. Lordship means every area of your life is under his leadership. If Jesus is Lord, you do, you'd withhold nothing. You give him ownership. That doesn't mean that all of a sudden you can't have good things and you can't enjoy nice things and you can't enjoy the fruits and joys of your hard labor. What it does mean is that you thank God for all the blessings. You thank him for what he's given you. And in the next moment, if he says, will you sell it all or will you give it up so others can benefit from the proceeds of those things, you'll say, yes, Lord, and you'll start selling. Who owns this stuff? Because in reality, God has given it all to us and we're nothing more than stewards of it. For years, I struggled with sarcasm. I really, I really did enjoy zinging somebody with sarcastic comments. I still fight that a little bit. I love their reaction when you zing someone else and people say, woo. Yeah, then one day Jesus came to me and said, you know, uh, your sarcasm is really nothing more than anger turned inside. It tells me that you still have an angry heart and unhealed issues of anger in your life from your childhood. Uh, what are you going to do about it? I don't know, God, what am I going to do about it? I want you to give up the sarcastic attitude and the sarcastic speech in your life. 
For years, I wrestled with that. But I'll tell you this, when I gave it up and allowed the Holy Spirit to help, healing took place. Lordship means you give God everything. Because Jesus will never be a part of your life, but he will gladly take all of your life. Jesus never settles for being the minority partner in the relationship. He doesn't settle for your leftovers. He doesn't settle for second place. However, if you give him all of your life, every nook and cranny, every thought, every desire, all of your skills and all of your talents, he will gladly take it and he will do some wonderful things in your life that will transform you and transform others. And lastly, I think we need to redefine surrender. You see, here we have this idea of surrender as we lose something. Because Peter, at the core of his being, when he has to surrender commitment to Jesus Christ 100%, what he's thinking is that all my faith and all my cultural identity that I've grown up with, everything I've known that's my comfort zone and my belief system and the expectations about Messiahship that came with all that, I have to throw completely away. And he wasn't willing to do that yet. He was believing that Jesus was Messiah, the Son of the living God, but he was not quite ready to completely buy him as Lord because he wasn't willing to surrender his religious expectations. He wasn't willing to surrender the messianic dreams of his generation because he was afraid of losing something. We confront this in the culture all the time. I, I, just, I hate it when sportscasters do this. Here's a team who goes out and gets a big lead in the game, you know, and all of a sudden the broadcast and the other team starts making a comeback and the broadcasters inevitably say, the team surrendered a lead. We never talk about how good the other team was to make the comeback. We usually talk about the team that was in front should have never lost a thing because they lost something in the, in the other team's comeback. And so we have all this negative thought and energy around it. And we often say that about things in history. That's where we talk about surrender the most, right? Army surrenders, it signifies defeat, you lose something. When British General Charles Cornwallis surrendered to an un underarmed army led by General George Washington, it signified that the American Revolution was over. The British had lost a continent. When Robert E. Lee surrendered at Mattomatic's Mat 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 courthouse. Whew, that was hard today. Courthouse there in Virginia in April of 1865. Jefferson Davis was upset because the war was lost and he was angry. We associate surrendering with losing something valuable in us, or something we care about. So what happens is people, when I say, and other ministers say, you need to surrender your life to Jesus, what we think, people think is, oh, that means I have to give up stuff. I can't really enjoy life. Oh, I have to do this list of all this stuff, and, and my free will is lost, and I'm losing control of my life choices. And so what happens is people start resisting surrendering to Jesus because they want to be in control. They want to be in charge. They don't want to lose something. But see, that's where we have it wrong. Because we often think that losing means someone else is won, and therefore we hate losing. Because let's be honest, in our culture, losers are rarely honored or remembered in our society. They aren't really remembered. But as followers of Jesus Christ, what you and I need is a new definition. Surrender is not losing our life. It's gaining our life. What Jesus and God were offering Peter, James, and John, that mountaintop's experience was a glimpse of the glory of God. He was offering them something more. 
If you surrender your life to me, you may suffer, you may hurt, but you're going to gain something more, the glory of God in you. And that's why the Bible says that if you believe in Jesus, what happens? You have a new life. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he appears to die, will not die. If you believe in Jesus, you inherit everlasting life. If you believe in Jesus, he promises that someone will come and live within you that will help you and guide you and be an advocate and a comforter and a counselor. He promises the very life coach that you desperately need in your life, himself, the Holy Spirit, the one who is able to give you every answer to every temporal situation you're involved, he's willing to bring all of heaven to bear on it because you believed in Jesus. When you believe in Jesus, you gain something. When you surrender your life, you gain something. Paul put it this way, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We get spiritual blessing. He says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with him, and seated, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. God is promising you, when you believe in Jesus, yeah, you surrender some things, but what you do is you gain something. You gain the right to sit at the right hand of God the Father, to be with Jesus, to be in his presence, to spend all of eternity with God. You get Jesus here living within you in this world so that you can experience the blessings of living in the land of the living, the goodness of God in the land of the living. You get that, but you also get eternity in God's economy. Surrendering is about getting something better. It's not about losing the way our culture says it. It's about gaining a new life in Christ. And therefore, we bury the old life, and we're raised up into a new life for one reason. We believe in Jesus, and we surrender to his lordship. Will you believe in Jesus and surrender to his lordship? Will you throw all that you have and all that you are into loving him and following him? And you will gain so much more. Father God, we just thank you for speaking to us and teaching us. Lord, meet us here. Speak into our hearts. Holy Spirit, soften our hearts and our minds that we will be willing partners with you. That we will willingly give everything to you that we have for your glory. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. May you stir our hearts to follow you with all that we have and all that we are. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen.
worthy to be worshipped or anything Jealous and kind, a sovereign and merciful, a who is like our God, who is like our God, who is like our God. Go in his peace with the glory of God leading you that you may declare to others the good news of Jesus Christ in the week ahead. Amen. Go in his peace. Mighty Mighty and innocent, a jealous and kind, a sovereign and merciful, who is like our God. Who is like our God? Who is like our Right now?